Welcome to Summit's Online Encounter. Our mission is to provide locations where people like you can have life-changing experiences with God. This is one of those locations. We also gather each week as a church in the heart of St. Paul. As disciples of Christ, we're doing our best to be on mission, deliver hope, and champion this city. At any point in your journey, if you want to take the next steps, or you just want to stay in the loop with everything going on at Summit, just grab your phone and simply text the phrase, Be Known, to 651-360-2908. We will send you a short form. Please complete it so you can be known in our Summit family. There's always new opportunities to mention, so here's what's coming up soon. We hope you take advantage of these opportunities to grow in community and your own faith. One of the ways to grow your faith is through worship. Worship with our lives in serving and also worshiping Jesus with a song. We have pre-recorded music in our sanctuary to create a place for you to worship with us virtually. So focus in, give way to the space needed, and invest some time in worshiping Jesus. Thank you.
One of the rhythms that's important to following Jesus is studying scripture. As we study the Bible, we can have hope, find guidance, be corrected, and receive truth into our lives. Let's open up God's word and hear this week's message. Everybody's got an imagination. Your thoughts, your dreams, maybe even when you daydream and your thoughts drift, we have got an imagination. God has wired us with a beautiful thing called a mind. And at Summit, at least the people of Summit here that gather, we want to have a kingdom imagination. We want our minds, our thoughts, our dreams focused on building the kingdom. What you first need to know when you think about our imagination is that every single one of us will live in a story. You live in a story that you create in your mind. Your life and your perspective actually lives within a story. James McClendon says it best that your life is a tournament of narratives. There are things that are going to be battling to be a part of the story. They're going to war against each other. Some things good, some things great, some things hard, some things horrible. The the tournament of narratives is a story that we tell ourselves, that we live. And it's different for everybody. Some of us are artists. Some of us live in a perpetual painting and the world is being created and unfolding with every brushstroke. Some of us are victims where our narrative is one where everything is out to get us. We're the ones at the end of the stick, the ones that get the short end of the deal. Some of us are warriors where all of the narratives are easily understood as a battle where you carry a sword and a shield and everything about business and family life and your faith, it's all centered around the idea of war. Some of us are romantics where we are enthralled in the love narrative, the wispy, beautiful, music that constantly plays behind us. It's got to be a sting song. Fields of Gold would probably be a great tune to start with. This romantic interpretation. Some of us, uh, we're wired in a story where it's sports. Everything's a sports metaphor. You miss 100%, uh, 100% of the shots you don't take. Some of us are wired in our politics. Our, our life is a constant struggle between Uh, This voting block, that voting block, independents, libertarian, republican, or democrat. But we all live in a story. We all have a narrative in our imagination. Life is really a fulfillment of plots, if you will. Depending on your story or how you see the world, how God has wired you, if, if life is a romance, then you should be loved. If life is a battle, then you need to fight for the win. If light is a discovery, and that's your narrative, then you should be looking into and finding new things. I hope this is resonating with you because you've got a specific story. So do I. You've got a specific imagination, and so do I. But my question is, for you, when it comes to how you look at the world, what's your default? Have you ever thought about this? My question is just, what is your default narrative? What is the way that you see the world? Mine is probably more like an artist. Life is a project, so let's just, let's just make art. That's sometimes as good for me to look at the world like that, and it's also sometimes a burden, to be honest, where it feels like it's a never-ending project, and there's, no, there's not enough time to make the art. What is the people of Summit story here? at this church, the narrative. Well, I think sometimes it's easy for church in the West here, in the U.S. specifically, to make a story just about numerics. What I mean by that is the kingdom imagination that a lot of people are limited to, maybe by default, is the numeric numbers about nickels and noses, Uh, the dollars, and the donors, the people in the seats, and the money in the bank. It's really easy for us to limit our imagination if we're not careful 
as we build God's kingdom just to attendance, I don't want to limit my imagination in the kingdom of God's endless expansion. I don't want to live in a small story for Summit. A great facility, some great music, maybe a little haze, not too much. Great lights, chemistry with the church staff, some really good pastries, you know, uh, a great welcome center. I don't want to have just a few friends at church or my professional or personal benefits that come with a community like this. I don't want a small story for you. I don't want a small story for St. Paul. I don't want a small story for the people of Summit Church. I don't want a limited, bankrupt imagination for us. I want a kingdom imagination. And so when we get these ideas of our lives, we have to really look at Jesus's parables. We're going to go through three colors, if you will, of a kingdom imagination. Three colors that we paint with here at Summit to really beautify everything that we're doing within our context, local and, and global. I, I do want to just simply pause just, just for a second, um, just to remind you that at Summit Church here, the people of Summit, when we gather in person for our church uh, services, that we are already successful. There's been crazy growth and crazy great things. And, you know, I say this all the time. I don't want us to, you know, be a big church. I want us to be a healthy church. And if it grows big and we're ministering to people, and that's great. But the point is, is the idea that we get so caught up in attendance, I just want to make sure you know that no matter what part of Summit's journey we are on, by all measures, we've been numerically already successful. If you think about this, I just want to read a couple alarming statistics and just let you know how we play into those places. Not by way of comparison in a negative way, but just highlighting this point that if our imagination is only based on attendance and people that gather in a church service, we're already smashing it. We're already arrived. We can stop dreaming. We can stop asking God to do other things because we've already got it all done. The U.S. average congregation that gathers in a building, it usually seats around 200. Um, only 65 people actually attend the church service each week on a national level. This means that half of all churches have fewer than 65 people in their weekly worship service. In the last 20 years, the average attendance has actually been cut in half. Now, these numbers are pre-COVID. Dropping in each fact study, the median worship service attendance among U.S. congregations has declined from 137 in the year 2000. So that means specifically in this study, way back even 20 years ago, 45% of the churches had fewer than 100 people in weekly attendance, and that number now has climbed to 65% of churches have fewer than 100 people in quote-unquote attendance. By that measure, 65% of the U.S. churches already gathering fewer than 100, we are already successful. Congratulations, Summit Church, the people of Summit. We did it. We've arrived. Let's just quit. The, the truth is, is that is the furthest thing from the truth. We need a kingdom imagination. We need a big vision of the mission God has for us. Three colors, three places. If you have your Bible, open up to Matthew 13. And the first stop along the way, or the first color that we use to really create with when it comes to kingdom imagination is the parables of Jesus. The parables of Jesus inspect our lives, interpret our present, help us navigate the future. That revelation, it feeds our imagination. It's a beautiful exchange of what we know and what Christ is teaching. And the parables of Jesus are something we take very seriously here at church. 
the people of Summit, I always encourage you all to uh, dig for yourself. When it comes to Jesus' parables, you will only uncover what you dig for yourself. You will only find the treasure that you sought. Not the one I handed to you, but the one that you have dug for. The parables of Jesus, they enhance or you could say um, unlock our imagination. Stories do this. Um, Jesus' truth breaks through in a new ground. They break into our heart in new spaces. It's really beyond just normal conventional wisdom that we find ourselves enthralled in the parables of Christ. I love to say this. A great parable of Christ, the the parable of Jesus, it's like a, a picture, a mirror, and a window. If you think of the parables of Jesus as a picture, a mirror, and a window, It's going to give you something to see, it's going to give you a reflection, and it's going to give you a, really, a vision. Every parable of Jesus, if you read those parables, keeping in mind, what am I looking at, what am I being reflected to, and where is this challenging me to go? A picture, a mirror, and a window. It will help you understand fully more about what I mean when I say, The first color of a kingdom imagination is the parables of Jesus. Let's look at Matthew 13 briefly today. There's a parable here, and it's one of the first major parables that Jesus offers. Uh, They just left Copernicum. Uh, They got in this boat, and they got to this place called the Cove of the Sower, where Jesus is going to dress his audience, and you can actually see the geographic location of this cove how it would be like a natural amphitheater where it would project his voice uh, over a massive amount of area that people could hear. Uh, and it's, it's pretty neat how he knew his audience, uh, mostly a farming community. They planted and harvested their entire life. Everything was centered around that. Uh, You know, a little bit about Farming 101 is many people didn't actually own the land. They actually would, you know, lease it or be able to use it. Um, There weren't a lot of fences. Uh, There were like little tiny paths to walk on that would divide different crop shares, different places. But you didn't really have the kind of modern, you know, agriculture setup that we have with these big square miles. There were there like really planting season that were always coinciding with the former and the latter rains. There were a early rain and then there was a latter rain. That shows up in scripture continually, um, not only as a physical rainfall at a specific time in the year, but also um, really as a beautiful metaphor uh, for the reign of Christ. November, December, um, you know, and then March and April. November, December, they would plant, you know, March and April, it'd be harvest or maybe even June. So you got these, you've got these early rains and late rains. Um, The rocks in the soil were actually left. You didn't take rocks out of a field. You left them there for shade. Uh, You didn't level it all out. You wanted the water to pool. It's not exactly what you'd see when you go down to like, you know, the plains of Minnesota or the surrounding areas, you know, in in St. Paul here, where there's farming communities, you just didn't see rocks. You just don't see water pooling. It's actually the opposite. We clear the rocks. We get the drainage systems put in. That's really not how they did this. Um, seeds were actually sown before the land was tilled. We take these big tractors, you know, and they go through the land and they till it all up uh, and they prop the soil, but. Really, seeds were just thrown before you would even till it. Um, You'd throw a seed uh, amongst the thorny ground, if you will. If you read in in Matthew 13, verse 1, I just want to go through a few things and we'll move on to the other colors to understand fully the kingdom imagination. The same day Jesus went out of the house, sat beside the sea, and a great crowd gathered about him. He got in the boat and sat in it. And the people stood on the shore, and then he took many things and told them these parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, 
and the birds came and ate it up. Now, anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, Jesus is saying the evil one comes and snatches it away. The birds come and take that seed and it's snatched away. That's, that's the first part, that it's removed from their um, heart. The seed is sown along those little rocky paths. Jesus continues in verse 5. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It springs up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Well, Jesus explains this in verse 20. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have got no root, they only last a short time, and when trouble or persecution comes because of the world or the word, they fall away. Verse 7, Jesus says, Another seed, the third type, falls among the thorns, which actually grew up and choked out all the plants. Now in verse 22, Jesus explains what he means by this. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth actually choke the word, making it truly unfruitful. Back to verse 8, still the other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred or sixty or thirty times that was sown. Now, this is just a side note in my notes that I thought was worth highlighting. In Genesis 26, 12, you can look it up for yourself, Isaac planted crops in the, in the land at the same year, and you can read a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him, and a hundred is like an amazing number. Like, it's like the best ever. However, when you look at this, I'm not so sure it's about the number comparison, um, but it's actually what the soil can actually handle. It's about bandwidth. It's not about which one is better, but it's which soil actually is more fruitful. Uh, I think Exodus 18, 21 talks about our bandwidth. And what you need to know, first and foremost, when we're looking at the different soils, which we will look at, God can use all of those soils along the path, along the journey that you or I are on. And Jesus ends... Um, in verse 23, where he explains the good soil in the hundred or sixty times fold, he says the seed falling on good soil, in verse 23, refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. And this is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Like, it makes up for everything else. And then Jesus says in verse 9, whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, what you need to know is the kingdom imagination of Jesus' parable helps us understand as the people here that gather at Summit, there are four different types of people in your life. There are four different types of people in uh, St. Paul. There are four different types of people in maybe even the church that gathers here. Now, I do know that there are you know, Myers-Briggs tests that you can take about your personality or the Enneagram or a disc profile or you can see what animal you more associate with. But what I love about the parable of Christ in the, in the soils here is he asked me the question and I'll ask you this question. What kind of soil are you? What soil type are you? Which of the four? If you're the first soil, that Jesus talks about in Matthew 13, maybe you need understanding. Maybe you, you truly need to ask the question, what don't you really understand? That's a great place to start. Maybe you're the second soil, if you will, that you just need a foundation. You look at your roots, they're tiny, they're not there. How you respond in your own storms you know, is Jesus the anchor in it or the sender of it? You maybe just need to build the foundation of the promises that God has for you. Maybe you're the third uh, soil where you need to understand that you're not the source, that 
your job isn't the source, that he's the source. And you, you maybe need provision, uh, and you also maybe need perspective. You need provision numerically, financially, because you have none. Or you need perspective and wisdom that everything that you have is really all of his. Maybe you need to understand fully that God has his eye on those birds, another one of Jesus' parables, and how much more precious are you? And maybe some of you need the perspective of, man, is this all there is? Like my wealth, is that it? And maybe the fourth type of soil, if this is you, you just need the seed or the spark or in verse 23, the mission. Maybe you are that soil that is just waiting for the assignment. And can I invite you into all that God is doing here in St. Paul, in the kingdom of God, through the people of Summit? Maybe you just need to get in the game and just start sowing. If you cultivate the soils, no matter which one you are, which one your friends are, which one your family is, which one the coworkers in your world are, and you start to cultivate the soils where if they need foundation, or, or excuse me, where they need understanding or foundation or, or perspective or provision, or maybe just seed or spark, when you start looking at people in the way that Jesus is referring to us as soils, what you need to know is when you cultivate the soils with Jesus' parables and your own Jesus story, this becomes your journey. Cultivate those soils in people's lives with this parable and start to understand that God wants to make us all into fertile soil that can produce 160 and maybe even 30 times than what we could ever ask, seek, or imagine. Have that big kingdom imagination for you and for others no matter what soil you, you find yourself in now, let the parable of Jesus bring you there. It's a beautiful exchange. It'll enrich you, it'll deepen you, and the reward and the harvest in your life and others will be great. Use that. Use that space to think about the kingdom. And that imagination is big. To help you apply the truth found in scripture, we always like to ask three questions. What did you learn about God? What did you learn about yourself? And how are you going to apply what the Holy Spirit is speaking through scripture to your life? We hope that these questions help bring clarity for you. Thank you for being a part of our online encounter. Join us in person sometime as we gather as a church on Summit Avenue or join us here virtually again next week. Let me just say, our city of St. Paul is absolutely amazing. I encourage you to check out all the history it has to offer. And you need to know Summit Church, this church has been a part of that history with so many amazing churches in our city. But speaking specifically about the people of Summit, well, we've been gathering here since 1932. And my hope is that this would be a rich history. It would be our forward legacy. History is a thing of the past, but legacy, it makes way, you know, for the future. So the question I have for us is, where are we going? Uh, that is a good question. Our vision is simple. It's really to see all of people and beyond living as disciples of Christ, people full of hope, uh, fully known, actively loving one another, living a spirit-led life. Our mission, it's also simple as well, to provide rhythm, location, opportunity for you to have a life-changing experience with God. Uh, you know, we all journey in our diversity to do these three things. Become disciples of Jesus, deliver hope, and to champion our city. That's where we're going, and that's what we're doing. So maybe a question for you is, where are you going? You know, what are your next steps? I would encourage you to do this. Join one of our monthly expeditions. The expedition is a simple experience where you can find out more about who you are in Christ, who Summit Church is, what we do around here, and how you can maybe even you know, play a part. It's less than two hours of your time uh, for the whole month. We also feed you amazing food and even provide childcare. So the question is, where are you going? Hopefully to the expedition is my thought. We're all on a journey following Jesus, maybe together. We just might not be us without you. We'll see you at the summit.